Greetings, greenhouse people, and welcome to another episode of Tech On Demand, brought to you by Grower Talks. I'm your host, Bill Calkins, and our goal here is to help you grow your best crop ever by sharing cultural and technical information based on discussions with experts around the globe, although sometimes we'll cover other topics in the horticulture realm, like nursery and retail. This time we're joined by Aaron Palmatier, Senior Technical Service Representative with Bayer Ornamentals, to talk about foliar diseases of ornamental plants. Aaron brings extensive experience solving problems and providing pest and disease management recommendations for ornamental producers and landscape professionals, and we are going to talk a lot about disease in this episode. Aaron's a former ornamental specialist at the University of Florida and received his doctorate in plant pathology from Auburn University and his master's and bachelor's degrees in plant and soil science from Southern Illinois University at Carbondale. You'll want to stick around to the end of this podcast to learn about a new resource from Bayer, a Spanish language pest ID guide that promises to be a must have at all greenhouses. Welcome, I am Bill Calkins, Senior Editor for Grower Talks and Green Profit, and I'm excited to be joined by Aaron Palmatier with Bayer, who's back to continue our series of podcasts covering a range of topics related to pest and disease control on greenhouse and ornamental crops. This episode will focus on foliar diseases of ornamental plants, a topic that's right in Aaron's wheelhouse and also critical to greenhouse professionals of all shapes and sizes. Aaron, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Bill. Great to be here. And of course, uh, talking about one of my favorite topics today with with, uh, diseases of ornamental plants. Excellent. Excellent. So to get us rolling, can you just share a little bit about why you feel leaf spot disease management has to be at the top of the priority list for growers all across North America and probably around the world? Yeah, absolutely. So, So one of the things, Bill, is that you no, know, my my background uh, when I was in graduate school, I actually you know coming from Illinois, I worked on soybeans and corn, and and, and I always like to to share the analogy of you know the farmers of agronomic crops are growing for yield, and yield is ultimately what they're going after bushels of of what it might be, and when it comes to our industry, our yield, so to speak, is is plant quality. And, and so um, when you're talking about an agronomic crop, there are what they call risk thresholds or, or sometimes it's called a treatment threshold to where they know when a disease, the incidence or the severity of, of a leaf spot disease gets to a certain level, it's time to treat. Otherwise, it's going to affect the yield of the crop. And in, in our case... Um, you know, we, we don't really, I mean, I guess you could call it an aesthetic injury level, but, but we go on uh, nothing but quality. So, so we can't tolerate a leaf spot pathogen. Uh, that's just not going to sell very well. And so, so one thing is from a, from an aesthetic standpoint, it is all about plant quality. And that's why it's, it's so important to, to keep a handle on, on these leaf spot pathogens. They, they may not be fatal diseases um, to where you're losing plants, but when you're losing quality, you're losing money. And that, that, that's really where it comes down to, you know, keep it, keeping a really solid program in play and and a handle on, on leaf spot diseases. That makes a lot of sense. And you're right. Plant quality is definitely King. I think now more than ever, uh, the threshold for poor quality is, is, is very low and and retailers are expecting top-notch quality because low quality means dump and shrink in the greenhouse or at retail. So I I think that's a really good way to look at it is that our yield is our quality and that's what needs to be top of mind at all times. Absolutely. Yeah. And I know that uh, you're a major proponent of diagnostics when it comes to plant disease. And why don't you let the listeners know why plant disease diagnostics is especially critical for foliar issues and maybe some of the key differences between leaf spot diseases and symptoms caused by other factors that may not be living. Yeah, that, that's a really, I mean, it, this is really important. Um, 
You know, and I, I said in a previous podcast, people always uh, laugh or joke with me about my saying about you can talk to plants and they don't talk back. And, and so, you know, diagnostics is just so important when you're dealing with a, a silent patient. If, if you will. And, and one of the things uh, when it comes to leaf spot diseases is that they can easily, the symptoms can easily resemble those that are caused by uh, what, I, what I call non-parasitic disorders, uh, but, but non-living factors. And, and, you know, I know a lot of growers uh, that use diagnostic clinics uh, they get frustrated because honestly, nine out of 10 times you submit a sample to a clinic and it comes back no pathogen found or, or non-parasitic disorder. And that, that's frustrating. But the, pro, the, the reality is, is that it's, it, it's very common um, that you can have, whether it's nutritional uh, you know, deficiencies or toxicities, whether it's a physiological disorder. There's, there's things, you know, such as edema, there's mesophyll cell collapse. There's, you know, especially when you start talking about some of the succulents um, in, in our, you know, that are, that are really hot commodities in our industry, there are some bizarre uh, physiological or abnormal things that can happen to these plants um, that, you know, could, could easily be mistaken for a, a disease. And so one of the things um, when it comes to, to leaf spot pathogens, um, you know, there's, the, in general, you, know, you have fungal diseases, uh, which are going to be the most common, and you have some bacterial diseases that, that are less common, not to say that they're not, they're not less important, but, you know, recognizing the symptoms that are caused by these pathogens. And, and one of the things, uh, it's always important to examine the tissue and look for what's called a sign, which a sign is, is actually evidence of the damaging factor. So for example, if you have a, a rust disease, um, you would go and you'd look on, on the underside of the leaf for any evidence of that sporulation. And, and rust fungi are called rust in that the spores um, can often resemble uh, a rusty like appearance on, on the surface of the leaf or on the, on the, um, on the backside of the leaf, the underside of the leaf. And so, so if you see a sign associated with, with a leaf spot, then that's definitely, uh, uh, you're on the right track for, yeah, that is actually a, a fungal leaf spot disease. But um, when it comes to your, your non-parasitic disorders, you really have to, you, you have to rule them out. I mean, you, if you go to a diagnostic lab that just specializes in plant diseases, um, they may not have the capacity to tell you that you have a nutritional disorder. Um, they could very likely uh, identify a physiological condition. Um, but their, their primary role is to try to rule out that a living pathogen is a, a factor in, in, in what you're seeing I mean, what's causing, what's causing the symptoms. And so I, I think that, you know, diagnostics is definitely the, the fundamental, um, it's, it should be the background of any kind of, of management or the foundation, I should say, of any kind of management program, because you really need to know what you're up against uh, to make, I mean, when it comes to cost-effective disease management, if you know what you're dealing with, you're going to make better decisions. You're going to save time, uh, frustration from not being able to control something. And ultimately, you're going to, you know, you're going to save money by making good decisions um, with, a, with, a prior, uh, with a proper diagnosis. And, and so... Um, the the leaf spots again you want to look at you want to look for any indication of, of signs and then the other thing is is when it comes to you know some of these leaf spot pathogens the symptoms are 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 across different species of plants are very similar in a lot of ways like so a powdery mildew for example you're going to see what looks like you know powder like like growth on, on, in, in the case of powdery mildew, more, more so on the upper side of the leaf. And then if you're dealing with a leaf spot like uh, anthracnose, for example, a lot of your anthracnose fungi, 
they cause lesions or spots. They form like concentric rings. Um, and some people may refer to that as like a target spot. And that's just how the pathogen grows on that lesion. But you, you know, growers can become more familiar with the different types of symptoms. There's a, there's a, you know, tons of information out there on the web and a lot of the university extension programs have resources. Bear has resources um, that they can, um, consult uh, to, to narrow things down just based on, on, on symptoms alone. That, make, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I love your silent patient analogy. And the other, another thing that, that just struck me is the last two disease discussions that I've been involved with, one has been edema on begonias. And the question was, you know, what, what's going on with my begonias? And then the other one was rust on asters. And it's just funny that you, that you mentioned those two. And we're recording this at the end of August. And I wonder, is, is now just the time that those issues pop up? Or is, is that something that's ongoing um, throughout the yeah. growing seasons? Yeah, yeah. So you're like you mentioned rust on asters. Definitely, um, you know, you, you start seeing that. It, depending on where you are, your rust de type diseases can occur all year long, believe it or not, like especially in a place like South Florida. But, but predominantly spring and then, and then if, the, if the nighttime conditions are cool enough during the summer, you can see rust. And then in the fall, you see, you see rust. And when it comes to like edema, you know, that's um, yeah, oftentimes if you've got a uh, high relative humidity, uh, poor air movement. You know, the plant is responding uh, to environmental fluctuations and then it starts to do weird things like, like holding water in those, in those cells in the leaves. And, and, um, and so that can occur, you know, depending on the crop anytime throughout the year, but we do see it uh, fairly often during the heat of the summer. Um, and, and, you know, it's just the, uh, it's the conditions and the transpiration of the plant um, that it decides that it wants to start doing weird things. Oh, that, that's interesting. And it was the, the discussion on the rust did center on relative humidity. So uh, sounds like everybody's in sync here. So let's, let's dive into the deep end. And, and, and I think this, this question sounds simple, but I suspect it isn't, is how exactly does disease happen? And Maybe now is the time to give an overview of the different types of fungal and bacterial leaf spot pathogens that most commonly attack uh, the plants that we're talking about today. Yeah, no, no, it's a great, great question. And, and you know, anybody, I, I mean, I, again, I, my training's in plant pathology, but I feel strongly that anybody, any horticulturist that's working with plants has to really know some of the fundamentals about plant pathogens and, and, and you know, how disease happens because disease just doesn't occur. So, so basically there, there's a real, um, I guess, simplified way to describe how disease happens and the epidemiologists, the people that study disease um, spread in time and space, they, kind of came up with this disease triangle and essentially there's three factors um, of the triangle and you have your susceptible host. So any kind of commercial level of growing, you're going to have a high population of susceptible hosts at any given time. And so you've got your, your plants as, as the host and then the pathogens. Now these, these organisms, whether we're talking about fungi or bacteria or nematodes, you know, they, they move in the environment. Uh, they move in soil, they move on contaminated plant material. They, they move readily in wind, wind blown rain, any, you know, th those kind of factors. So, so the, the pathogens come into the environment or into the, the environment with the host and then the third factor is the environmental conditions. And so, so you can have your susceptible host and the pathogen there. And if the conditions are not favorable, if, if the relative humidity is not just right, the temperature is not just right, you won't have disease. Disease is going to occur when the environmental conditions are favorable and the environment really drives disease. Now, I, I also like to, I, I use a, when I talk about the disease triangle, I actually use a tetrahedron. I add a 
add a fourth uh, point to it. So it's pyramid, if you will. And, 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 and I um, like to talk about uh, people because we definitely move the plants and we can uh, move the pathogens as well. But we also, to a certain degree, we can modify the environmental conditions, um, and especially in a greenhouse production. And so, so we definitely play a role in, in disease. Um, and so, so that's basically how, you know, this, to, to describe how disease occurs um, is the triangle. And, and so the, when it comes to leaf spot pathogens, um, you know, fungi, produce spores and they these spores predominantly you know they're wind blown um and then when you have leaf wetness uh so if you're using overhead irrigation or you have a rain event when those spores land on that leaf um and the 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 right amount of moisture is there that's when the infection process occurs and subsequently the the whole disease product process occurs and 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 so that's kind of a, a just a simple example of, of how a fungal disease occurs and then and then with bacteria you know these are single-celled organisms so they're they're a little bit different now and I can go into that in a little bit but but talking about the different types of, of leaf spot uh, pathogens you know in in ornamentals um, if you're you, probably one of the biggest players are the anthracnose fungi. Um, and there are a number of different genera of anthracnose fungi, but growers, if you look at a label, they're likely to see Colitotricum is a genus that's, that's got numerous species um, across uh, different or, ornamental plants. And, um, it, it occurs whether you're in a greenhouse, whether you're in an outdoor in a nursery, uh, you can see leaf spots caused by um, anthracnose. And anthracnose, those fungi, um, they typically start to turn on in, during the, the warmer times of the year where you have the high relative humidity. A, a lot of these leaf spot pathogens um, are, are more, I guess, prevalent when you have high relative humidity and you have warmer temperatures. Now there are exceptions, but, but your anthracnose, your alternaria, your cercospora, your septoria, um, those are some of the predominant um, leaf spot pathogens that, that like those kinds of conditions. And then if you are a greenhouse grower, one of the biggest leaf spot issues could be botrytis. And, and you know, botrytis likes a little bit of cooler conditions, uh, but it also likes high relative humidity. And it's a very prolific sporulator, so it just produces massive amounts of spores. It's a tremendous opportunist. So when you have any kind of wound on that plant or any kind of stress, Botrytis takes over. And, and the same can be said for a lot of these, these pathogens. A lot of them are, are tremendous opportunities. But um, when you get a very aggressive pathogen, uh, it, that's when it can become uh, real problematic when, when conditions are, are favorable. And then um, outside of some of the, the, the common leaf spot um, fungi, you also have your, your powdery mildews, you, you know, um, you also have downy mildew as, you know, downy mildew is, is a little bit different in that downy mildew is not only a leaf spot pathogen, but it's, it can lead to plant death and actually cause fatality uh, because of, of how aggressive the pathogen is and just can just rot tissue. So, so one thing I, I will mention as I, as I talk about these leaf spots is that your a leaf spot is just that it's a small spot on a leaf but w as the disease progresses so like an example would be like with a downy mildew pathogen it may start as a spot but it will quickly start to expand and and when it expands and it starts to cover larger portions of the plant we call that a blight and and so um, you may be familiar with the term like uh, late blight and, you know, the late blight of potato 
uh, uh, pathogen. That's actually a Phytophthora species, but it's a foliar leaf spot type disease at first, but it turns into a devastating blight and can subsequently kill the plants. Now, so downy mildew kind of falls into that category, um, but then your powdery mildews, they're more of in lines of what I was talking about when it comes to aesthetics. Powdery mildews are not going to kill the host, but they, they will definitely uh, cause you know, unthrifty plants. And of course, you know, you get that powdery like sporulation and just, uh, it could, you know, if you just think if you've got a beautiful poinsettia crop, you get, you know, that's in color and then you get an outbreak of powdery mildew, it's going to look like somebody went through and just and painted the plants white. And, and that's not, and then, you know, and of course they're going to eventually turn yellow and start to defoliate and, and it, it could turn into a real nasty situation. So, um, that's, uh, you know, Again, it's not a fatal type pathogen. And then the same can be said for rust. Um, rust, just like powdery mildews, um, can, can affect the aesthetic quality of the plants. And, and, and because I'm talking about those two, I will mention um, relative humidity for powdery mildew is super important and for rust is the same. However, those pathogens don't need the leaf wetness that a lot of the other diseases require. Um, and, you know, leaf wetness duration is so important for the infection process. But when it comes to your powdery mildews, they don't even like freestanding water. Those spores, all they need is, is relative humidity. So, so having said that, with rust and powdery mildews, you might see those in, during times where you think it's actually dry because it's not raining, but you have that high relative humidity. Very different from your traditional fungal leaf spots like your anthracnose and your cercosporas and your septorias. And so um, that's it's just kind of interesting the way these, these fungi have, have uh, different different requirements, um, you know, for, for the whole disease process to occur. And then I mentioned, you know, the bacteria, you know, really there's a couple, uh, predominant bacteria genera, um, that I think most growers are familiar with, and that's going to be, you know, your pseudomonas and your xanthomonas. Those are probably two of the most well-known, but, when you talk about leaf spots, another one that can come into play uh, is, are the soft rot bacteria. So, um, you know, the, or Winnie is the old name. Some are now called the pectobacterium. And some are called decaea, uh, depend, depending on, you know, these, these taxonomists change names, seems like all the time. But these, these bacterial pathogens, um, they, a lot of times, uh, the conditions, I would say the conditions fall more in line with those of your traditional leaf spot fungi. So they also like the leaf wetness and they also like the high relative humidity. Um, the majority like warmer temperatures, um, for the whole, whole disease process to occur. And so, um, I will also mention that, you know, there are other bacterial pathogens that you could come across, like the, the Pseudomonas, that genus has been split up, like there's a Cidovorax is another um, offset of, uh, that, that you might find in, in either the literature or, or on a label. And then, you know, when it comes to both Pseudomonas and Xanthomonas, there's, there's multiple species um, that, that occur within ornamentals. Um, and, you know, depending on uh, some, some species have very broad host range, uh, like Pseudomonas uh, chicorii, for example, it covers a number of bedding, causes disease on a number of bedding plants. And then you have some Xanthomonas species that may be very host specific. And so that's kind of the, you know, the, I guess, a, a simplified overview of, of some of the leaf spot uh, pathogens on ornamentals. Okay, and I, and I like the I like the fact that you added people to that disease triangle because we all know, and especially I'm sure there's many listeners that move throughout their greenhouse throughout the, each day, and uh, can certainly traffic the pests and diseases as well as being in charge of those environmental um, controls that that is a fundamental part of that pyramid. So 
I like that, that you added people that makes a lot of sense. And you, you talked a lot about the, about these fungal and bacterial pathogens, whether it's the, the, the genus or the multiple species, some can be broad, some can be host specific. Do you have, I mean, is there anything else to tell the listeners about the differences between fungal and bacterial pathogens and why growers need to be conscious of them? I mean, you mentioned that they start sometimes just that aesthetic and then move, you know, progress to fatality. So I guess that's, that's sort of the, the bottom line, but anything else you want to uh, tell the listeners about the differences between the two? Yeah, sure. That's a, that's a really another great question, Bill. And it's, it's important to, especially, you know, if you're dealing with, with a bacterial disease, um, because, you know, again, I mentioned that fungi are the predominant pathogen of ornamental plants. There's more fungal diseases than, than any other uh, uh, pathogen that attacks plants. And so, and, and fortunately, we have a lot of uh, effective tools for, for managing fungal diseases. Now, now, bacterial pathogens are not as prevalent on plants. Um, however, they are as important because they can be much more challenging uh, to control when you have a bacterial disease. But with some of the fundamental differences, I mentioned um, earlier that, you know, fungi for a leaf spot disease, the spores land on the leaf surface under the right conditions, the infection process occurs subsequently the disease cycle um, carries on. And it, so with bacteria, bacteria are actually single celled organisms. So, so we're, we're talking the cellular level and um, they, uh, they do not have the capacity to directly infect plants. So, so what that means is, is that they have to get into the plant through a wound or through a natural opening. And that's one of the reasons why we have less bacterial diseases. Because uh, a fungus, a spore of a fungus can land on a plant surface and, and, and pen, you know, directly penetrate anywhere on that leaf surface or sometimes it's even on the stem or the petioles and, and then cause disease. The cells of the bacteria, when they land on the leaf surface or anywhere in the canopy of the plant, they're going to get in through the stomates, the hydathodes, or, or it could just be in, in cellular damage that has occurred from either an insect feeding or, or even just uh, wind, mechanical damage from, from wind um, is where bacteria will infect the plant. And so that's really important to understand that because uh, when it comes to the symptoms uh, you see a leaf spot caused by a fungus and it can, it can occur anywhere uh, on that leaf surface and it can be across veins. Uh, it can, uh, again, it, it, the spots can be randomly placed anywhere on the, on the leaf. When it comes to the bacteria, um, oftentimes the spots are vein delineated. So they're restricted because what happens is the cells of the bacteria, since they aren't directly penetrating and, and breaking down that leaf tissue, they're getting into the, the, the leaf and then, uh, then the disease process occurs, but oftentimes they can't break down that, that tough vein tissue. So a lot of your bacterial leaf spots are going to, are going to look like, almost like puzzle piece, like, uh, between veins. And, and that's a real key difference between diagnosing a fungal leaf spot versus a, a bacterial leaf spot. And if you see in, in like some of the ericaceous plants, like philodendrons or, or anthuriums, they have, uh, they have hydathodes, um, in the, the, the margins of the leaves and the cells of the bacteria get in through those, those hydathodes and, and you see these characteristic uh, spots that are associated with those leaf, with the leaf margin. And that's another uh, characteristic that, yeah, you're dealing with a, a, a bacterial pathogen. And then <clears throat> one other point, excuse me, one other point is that depending on the host and depending on the species, 
some of these uh, bacterial diseases can go systemic in, in the plant. And, and when you get a s- systemic infection, uh, that's a whole different ball game because, you know, you think you could just go in and, and maybe treat or prune. Um, but in some cases, if you get systemic infection in a plant, you're going to have a very difficult time um, being able to manage that. Uh, and, and, and that just opens up a whole nother can of worms. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. So I think that that is a good concise, uh, look at some of the different pathogens and, and causes. So let's move into how to avoid them. And I know you've talked about the relative humidities and the importance of environmental control. So I imagine that's going to factor in, but are there are there other best practices growers need to follow in order to minimize uh, the risk of, of these pathogens? Yeah, absolutely. So, so one thing is, of course, um, the, you know, I mentioned that these, the, the leaf spot fungi are, are coming in by spores being blown in. They can also come in on, on infected plant material. So, you know, first and foremost, you you want to make sure you're not bringing plants into your operation that already have leaf spots. If you see any leaf spots, um, it's it's not a good thing to bring unless you unless you feel a hundred percent that you know confident that you can control those or you're very familiar with what the disease is. Um, you want to minimize introducing any kind of disease. Uh, plant material into your operation. And then the other thing that's just key is, is managing the moisture. And I, and um, I can't say it enough how important that the leaf wetness is for that infection process. So, so the, the longer the leaves dry, the less likely you're going to have infection and subsequent uh, disease. And so you want to try to, I understand in, in a lot of cases, um, it's, it's just not cost effective to switch from uh, a micro jet or a drip type irrigation to an overhead irrigation. And, and a lot of growers are using uh, more, I know more growers using overhead irrigation than, than drip. And that's fine. Uh, they just need to recognize that, that you want to try to, uh, what I say, put your plants to bed dry uh, you want to try to keep the watering events earlier in the day uh, so that those leaves have time to, to dry off, um, going, especially going into the evening um, where uh, pathogens aren't sleeping. They're still doing their thing. And so, so moisture management is crucial. Uh, minimizing the introduction just by scouting again and then sanitation uh, is very important. Um, keeping things uh, clean is is uh, is where it's at from a from a standpoint of of reducing you know the potential for disease. And then you know there's also techniques. Um, I've seen all kinds of variations on the theme. Like in in nursery situations, there can be uh, they they I've even seen cases where they put up windbreaks of particular plant species to minimize the potential for inoculum blowing in structures placed in certain areas to, to, to minimize uh, potential for, for, you know, wind, wind blown um, spores and what have you. So, um, you know, it, it, there's all kinds of, I guess what we call cultural uh, adaptations that can be put into place to, to minimize um disease. And, and that's, again, it's all about uh, avoidance and, and, and really staying on top of, of, of inter- introducing um, disease tissue into, into your operation. It all starts with some type of, you know, it's a source of inoculum. And, and by reducing the potential for that inoculum to get in, you're just, you're, you're one step ahead of the game. Okay, and I, I, that, that makes a lot of sense. I think that Aaron's given us some good protocols to put in place. Um, you know, don't don't bring leaf spots in. Put your plants to bed dry. Keep your uh, keep close eye on sanitation and considering some structural barriers. I think those are all uh, uh, 
opportunities for growers to really improve in these uh, in these cases. But what if what if these uh, pathogens hit? Can you review some of the treatment options and rotations that growers need to consider? And I got to believe that resistance is also an issue here, so maybe address that as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when it comes to leaf spot diseases, and again, you can be as clean as clean gets, but there's always potential for seeing some kind of, uh, you know, start of a, of a, of a disease in, in production. And, and so early, it's, it's best to take early action to get it properly diagnosed. And then, you know, you're using the right tools uh, such as the fungicides that would be effective at, at controlling such disease. Now, one of the things that's uh, really important when it comes to fungicides, especially, is that you're rotating. These microorganisms have an unbelievable capacity or potential to develop resistance to, to fungicides, uh, some more so than others. Like some are very high risk, like botrytis. Um, so when you find, identify a fungicide that's effective, you want to you have two or three fungicides that are effective that you can rotate. And, and these two or three fungicides should be in different fungicide resistance action codes or, you know, the, the FRAC, that acronym is the Fungicide Resistance Action Committee. So the groups or the codes that they've come up with that are now on all the, you know, especially the newer versions of, of pesticide labels, you can see that frat group and it makes it very easy for rotating fungicide chemistries. And so um, there are, I mean, there's a handful of, I think some of the, just the, the, the proven diehard chemistries that have been used in ornamentals for leaf spot prevention. One would be like thiophanate methyls and active that's, that's commonly used. Another chlorothalonil has been around a long time. It's commonly used for, for some leaf spot pathogens. Uh, Bear has CHIPCO 26019, which is hyperdione. Um, it's been around a long time and it's very effective on botrytis. Uh, and also even, even some fusarium species that have been known to cause uh, leaf spots. Um, and then, you know, then you have, moving on, you know, the strobilirins. Um, so bear has compass, which is trifloxystrobin, um, and that can fit, fit in nicely in, into a rotation with, with things like thiophanate methyl or chlorothalonil. Um, and then you also have, you know, in, in more recent time, some of these, these premix combination fungicides. And the beauty of the premix combination fungicides is with, mul with multiple active ingredients and you, you're not just relying on a single mode of action, you reduce the potential for resistance in the pathogen population. But then also it makes it more convenient because a lot of these these fungicides are very broad spectrum. And, and when I talk about broad spectrum fungicides, I like to mention a bear's most recent introduction with, with bro, uh, broad form, broad form, meaning that it's super broad spectrum and that, you know, it takes uh, a lot of the, you know, it gives you a lot of flexibility and it takes some of the guessing out because um, it's targets so many different pathogens. Um, it just, it makes it that much easier uh, for the grower. However, I don't recommend that you just go in and just willy nilly and start spraying broad form thinking you're going to control everything. You still want to get a diagnos diagnosis to know exactly what you're up against. But it's nice when you have a fungicide that you can put out, let's say you're treating for botrytis, but you also have Altenaria and some Rhizoctonia in the mix and you can control all three of those pathogens with, with one product that, that makes it very convenient. And so, um, again, you, uh, when it comes to fungicides and when it comes to disease, I, I can't say it enough that it's all, all about prevention. Um, you really or you know, very early onset, you want to get something going if you're, if you don't have a, a, like a calendar based spray program. But I think most, growers um 
know what diseases they're up against and they've taken action and put together spray programs and they've got a pretty good handle on it. It's just, I just want to you know, reiterate that um, if something works well, be careful with it. Make sure you're rotating so that we don't lose that efficacy um, and, and spoil it for, for, for everyone else. Because sometimes when resistance starts to occur in ornamentals, uh, you can start seeing it going from, it's not just a, a local issue. It can become a national issue just because of the, the, like I mentioned with the movement of plant material in our industry, we pretend, we have that same potential to, to move pathogens. And so it's very important to uh, stay on top of the, the rotations when it, when it comes to uh, incorporating fungicides into a, a leaf spot disease management program. Man, I feel like these microorganisms are smarter than us sometimes, but I also think it's cool that there are a lot of smart people like you and the Bayer team that are coming up with these singular or these pre-mixed chemistries and rotations to help uh, growers stay ahead of the game. It's, um, it's got to be uh, uh, kind of a fun, fun project for you and the team to, uh, to try to stay ahead of these uh, microorganisms. <laughs> Absolutely. So again, Aaron, thank you so much for your time. I think that this is all fantastic information. Do you have anything to add before we, we close for this one? Uh, I, just, I just end on, remember, it's all about quality. And, and, and to keep that in mind, that you know, the, the higher the quality of the plant, the, you know, the stronger your reputation. And in order to grow high-quality plants, you've got to stay on top of disease management. Super important. Excellent. Well, I really appreciate your time. And this, I think that this has really been informative. You're, you really are an expert when it comes to, to topics like this. But the cool thing for the listeners is you're going to be back really soon to cover the root, stem, and crown rot diseases, which will make this sort of a two-part mini-series. So until next time, I'm Bill Calkins with Grower Talks. And on behalf of Aaron Palmatier and Bear, we want to wish you the best of luck avoiding crop diseases and effectively cleaning them up if they do strike. Bayer Ornamentals recently released an excellent tool that'll no doubt be quite useful in your greenhouse. It's a user-friendly Spanish language pest ID guide and I wanted to take a few minutes to talk to Bayer's Senior Technical Service Representative, Aaron Palmatier, about what's covered in the guide and how he sees it being used by greenhouse professionals across the United States. So Aaron, why don't we start with a quick overview of the Spanish Pest ID Guide and what growers can expect to find between the covers. All right, Bill. Um, yeah, first of all, the, the new Spanish Pest ID Guide from Bayer and help cultivate stronger communication in greenhouse and, and nursery operations. Uh, the, the whole idea is for a user-friendly guide. It's easy to follow, includes numerous pictures uh, to help Spanish speakers identify pests. Um, and the other thing is we've incorporated, you know, it, it, uh, some information on how to, to best use solutions from Bear. So we have some of our fungicide solutions, insecticide solutions, and, and herbicide solutions built into the guide. But it also includes information on what types of personal protection equipment should be worn when making these applications. Um, and one thing I will note also, uh, you mentioned in between the pages, but the guide is actually produced on a, on a really uh, high quality coated paper so that it's, it's gonna be nice for, you know, for having outside in the elements. Uh, and it's you know bound together uh, to survive you know wear and tear. Excellent. I, that's definitely always an issue uh, when you're working uh, in a greenhouse environment, and that's really cool that it includes all the photos um, that folks are going to need to ID these pests. So I think that that gives the listeners a pretty good overview. So one of my questions is why did Bayer decide to develop a Spanish language pest ID guide? Um, because you guys are known for all of your resources. So why you know. Why did you guys decide to uh, launch this uh, Spanish uh, language guide to supplement all these resources? 
Sure, sure. You know, so one, you know, the ability to quickly identify and treat pests is an important part of, you know, of what we do in ornamentals for, for healthy plants. And so it's even easier if you have a guide that speaks the language of, of some of, of, you know, some of the, the workers that are in your facility. And so, you know, that's why Bear developed a new ID guide it's specifically for Spanish speaking growers and, and laborers. And again, this, this guide is, is not like real advanced. This is, this is very, you know, uh, I, I like to say fundamental, uh, but the, the, the key is you know, easy to use. The guide helps bridge communication gaps to ensure everyone knows how to properly identify pests. And then, and then of course, use our products properly and, and, and safely. Um, you know, we want to, at Bear, we want to continue expanding diversity and inclusion and bringing people together. So I think the, the new Spanish guy does that. Yeah. That's awesome. And, you know, it is really, uh, like you said, all about communication and bridging those communication gaps. So I think that, uh, that that's a really important point. Um, the fact that it uh, talks about helping quickly identify, and I know that's one of uh, one of the things you always mention is that that diagnosis and how critical that is. So uh, that that's great. And this is going to be a really useful resource. Um, if listeners want to order a copy or multiple copies, how, how are they going to access this guide? Sure. So it's actually, it's going to be available and it's starting at, it's going to be sometime in you know the beginning of July and they'll be able to go on to the, the bear website. And it's really simple. It's just E S dot bear b-a-y-e-r dot u-s and then if you do forward slash spanish dash pest dash identification dash guide that that's a link that will uh, bring you right to a web page uh to to access uh to order the guides and you know go go ahead I was going to say, that's great. And we will actually put a link to that in the show notes so that folks can uh, quickly click on that link. Um, so that would be July 2020 availability. Um, and yeah, so all you need to do is look in the show notes uh, of this podcast and you'll see a, a quick link uh, to access this guide. So I, I appreciate that, Aaron. I, I definitely think growers are going to appreciate uh, the effort that Bayer put into this, and it's going to be a useful resource, really, for for greenhouses of any uh, shape and size um, that has a, a Spanish-speaking workforce. This is going to be a, a great tool to have in the toolbox. So I appreciate uh, you letting us all know about that. Mm-hmm.